Okay, so today we have a clear breach update on the results. We have Geo Energy Resources as well as initiations on APEC Real Realty Limited and Propnex. And then we have our macro and sector outlooks for the coal sector, Telco, China Banking, China Weekly, and also our technical uh, analysis. So first, we'll start off with ClearBridge uh, first Q19 results. So please take note that this report is produced by our StockFacts research program and we receive monetary compensation for the production of the report. So for ClearBridge, uh, this is their first results that we cover after the initiation last uh, month. And for them, they, their revenue stream mainly breaks down into two portions. First is a healthcare system, which consists of their renal care center revenue streams. So renal care is um, a dialysis treatment for patients. And also the healthcare system consists of laboratory uh, test revenue. So when they sell their test kits or when they do uh, tests like genome testing or esoteric tests, this flows into the healthcare system. Then the other revenue stream is their medical clinics and centers. So they have medical clinics um, and aesthetic clinics in Singapore. In Hong Kong, they have a, a medical center that does uh, health screening and vaccinations. And then in Philippines, they have uh, Mazan. Oh, no, uh, Philippines, they also have um, a chain of uh, dermal clinics as well. And Malaysia, they also have a chain of uh, GP clinics. So the positive this time around is the healthcare system uh, growing nine times year on year to 1.3 million. So healthcare system consists of TMJ. So TMJ is the clinic, uh, is the renal care center in Philippines. And then um, for Mazan, it's actually a medical center. It's quite a huge medical center uh, that does uh, basic uh, GP clinic services as well as a pharmacy business that uh, disperses drugs and also a laboratory business here. So the main reason why the healthcare system uh, grew nine times this quarter is because of the acquisition of TMJ in Indonesia. So it was acquired in April 2018. That's why in first Q18, it wasn't included in the revenue contributions. So for TMJ, the renal care centers increased uh, to 37 from 22 at acquisition. So the special thing about a renal care center is that it's a very recurrent uh, revenue streams. Patients need uh, dialysis treatments uh, for a lifetime. So out of these 37, 23 is operational and the remaining is still under construction. So we expect TMJ's revenue growth to pick up in the following quarters as renal care patient volume increase. So right now the patient care volume capacity is around 70% on average for the 23 operational hospitals. And also as more hospitals complete renovations, the revenue growth will pick up as well. So the revenue contribution for TMJ this quarter only comes from the 23 uh, operational hospitals. And as for medical clinics and centers, revenue grew 267% to 0 0.9 million. And this is mainly due to the group's expansion of uh, medical clinics and centers in Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Philippines, plus uh, revenue contribution from the Singapore uh, Medical Laser and Surgical Clinic in April 1-8. So this uh, MS LC does uh, dermatology treatments and laser treatments as well. The negative for Clearbridge is the temporary disruption to business in Mazan. So renovations at Mazan uh, began around 4Q18 and this resulted in a disruption to business in 1st Q19. So however, uh, renovations has been completed in February. So we expect the revenue uh, to flow in from the revenue completion, uh, from the renovation completion in 2Q19. So another thing that happened in Mazan is that the pharmacy sales fell to, due to a delay in medical subsidy claim uh, receivables from the DSWD. So this is mainly caused by a migration of their government uh, back systems. And also we expect margins to continue to remain under pressure. So their GP margin fell 14.6 percentage points to 43.5. And this is mainly due to the increase in purchases uh, and also direct expenses for their in-house lab testings, uh, outsourced clinical labs, consumables and med medicines by their clinics and centers. So all this is expected as they expand and then as they acquire more medical clinics and centers. So for our call, we still maintain buy with an unchanged target price of 0 0.28. So we believe the two primary growth drivers for ClearBridge is mainly the underlying, a uh, very strong underlying demand for healthcare in Indonesia, Philippines, and Singapore. 
So also they have they are always undergoing uh, aggressive M and A in various EBITDA accretive businesses. So this quarter, uh, despite a miss in earnings forecast, we expect higher revenue contribution to come from the following acquisitions, uh, to kick in from two Q onwards to reach our full year forecast. So the growth drivers uh, moving forward will be the recovery of patient volume from Mazan as they complete renovations and the government systems get settled. So their pharmacy sales should pick up as well. And the second thing is increased renal care patient volume in TMJ. So previously I mentioned that it's only 70% uh, operating capacity. So we expect the 70% to increase as well as more hospitals become operational and complete construction. Um, the re revenue stream from TMJ should improve as well. And also they recently acquired IGM in Indonesia. So IGM basically uh, is the contract between them and all the major public hospitals in Indonesia to do laboratory testings. So they manage the labs and then they do these tests, but the uh, staff costs and all that uh, should be borne by the hospitals themselves. So they have quite a few Class A uh, ward uh, class A hospital uh, collaborations with IGM in Indonesia. So another thing that happened this quarter is that they acquired new nine new dental clinics in Singapore. So they expect this to provide synergy within, within the group as uh, this can also be a form of contact between patients and uh, clear bridge to sell their esoteric tests and also their genome testings as well. And another thing that uh, is going to happen is the expansion of the Hong Kong clinic. So the thing about the Hong Kong clinic is that they are receiving a lot of demand from mainland Chinese coming to Hong Kong for their health screening as well as vaccination. So the Hong Kong clinic is facing over a lot of patients, so they're expanding it to twice the size. And renovations has just been completed. So in two Q, uh, in three Q, we should expect uh, the higher revenue flow to coming from the Hong Kong clinic as well. So for, uh, for the Hong Kong clinic, the average patients around 350 patients per month. So if they double up the size, we can expect probably twice of the current amount. And another thing that happened this quarter is also they acquired a new pediatric clinic in Malaysia. So this pediatric clinic is located in a very affluent part of Malaysia where there's a lot, a lot of new families uh, coming in and they expect patient volume for the pediatric uh, clinic to pick up as well. Yep, so this is uh, for Clearbridge Health. Next, I'll pass on to Guangzhou for Geo Energy Resources. Hi, good morning. Uh, next is Geo Energy's uh, first Q results update. So we downgrade our call to neutral with a lower target price of 15 cents. So the uh, what happened during first Q uh, was that um, the performance or the financials uh, didn't look good. So the positives for this quarter was that um, it delivered 1.9 million tons of coal sales, uh, which is on track to the 8 million of our FY19 target. And the negatives were was that um, it had the first gross loss since uh, first Q16. So the breakdown of the uh, business performance are shown here. So the uh, main uh, headwinds for this quarter was that the ASP uh, dropped substantially. You can see here, year on year, it dropped uh, by 31%. And the outlook for this counter was that we expect uh, we will continue to um, deliver its uh, annual production target. However, the overburden causes will be relatively high this year. Uh, because the TBR mine, which is the new mine, uh, just started to produce uh, last year. And we think that uh, the, the FY19's mining business will underperform uh, FY18's. And the most important uh, update was that uh, GEO is uh, likely to raise the debt to acquire another coal mine. Because right now uh, it has about 200 million US dollars uh, in hand, but uh, it's not enough to acquire the new coal assets. Because right now, according to the market rate, the 2P reserve will average at six to seven US dollars per ton. 
So that means um, they need to acquire maybe another a few hundred million uh, US dollars to uh, pan out this deal. If they don't deploy the cash, they may redeem the senior note, which worth a, a 300 million US dollars by the end of this year. So next is the Singapore Coal Monthly Update. So in May, China published the midterm 35 year plan evaluation and outlook for coal industry. So the, the authority signal that there is still room for 180 million tons of capacity cut for the next two years. And also the coal production will reach uh, 3.87 million billion tons uh, by 2020. So generally the over capacity issue will be resolved um, amidst the increasing market consolidation. That means the bigger or large size coal mines will uh, continue to dominate the market. Uh, for Indonesia side, the uh, Indonesia and China Coal Associations collaborate uh, in the coal mining sector. Both parties signed the MOU in May to uh, develop the coal mining and utilization development of environment environmental technologies and personal exchanges jointly. So this uh, signal the market that the Indonesian coal uh, may not be uh, restricted for the coal import. Um, and also the Indonesian government rejected the calls from the smaller mines for DMO re reduction. So previously, uh, some of the co-producers, they submit the uh, requirement for the reduction of the DMO. Uh, but right now, uh, at the moment, the DMO is still uh, about 25% of the last year's uh, production. So what we think is that um, in China, the ongoing clampdown on capacity and market consolidation will support coal prices. And also, uh, these policies from China will help uh, to concentrate on the capping of the upside of prices. So that means uh, the policies from China uh, is for the purpose to stabilize the coal prices. For the Indonesi Indonesian side, uh, we think that uh, these, their policies are more volume driven because uh, last month, uh, the local government initiated the infrastructure expansion plan, uh, which is about 400 billion US dollars. So the rejection on the DMO is in line with the ambitious expansion plan. However, we think that the policies will not take care of the downside of the coal prices. And we think that the producers will have to uh, ramp up the output uh, to offset the price headwinds in order to maintain or improve the profitability. And lastly, we think that um, this will hurt the smaller miners uh, with uh, smaller reserves and more dependence on the export market. So this six chart shows um, the current situations on the coal market. So we can see that uh, in April, the monthly production in PRZ actually uh, decreased. And also the import from Indonesia to China didn't grow a lot. Also the thermal power and uh, hydropower started to correct because the low season has come. And also the HBA prices dropped to a 22 month low that was mainly due to the Newcastle prices uh, drop further in April. And also the Qinguang Da 5,500 got uh, stabilized at slightly above uh, 600, 600 RMB per ton. And because of the low season, the port code inventory level started to stack up. So next I will pass on to Tara. Hi, morning everyone. Um, so this morning we initiated on the real estate agency sector along with uh, 
APEC Realty and Propnex. So we have a buy call on those two counters. So the real estate um, agencies market in Singapore is a um, dominated by Propnex and ERA, which is uh, op which is um, the APEC Realty's operating brand. So these two agencies alone already handle close to half of the total number of real estate agents, as you can see in the pie chart on the right. And in terms of uh, transactions, that flows through to about uh, average of 85% across all property transactions by number of units as of 2018. So this is um, an average um, market share for transactions across the primary sales, secondary resale and HDB resale. And um, other than that, they also have very high unleveraged return on capital. Both companies clocked in uh, high double-digit ROEs over the years. Propnex is about 31% and APEC Realty 17% for FY18. And this is to note that there's little to no leverage um, due to the very nature of the brokerage business, which does not require debt to operate on. And also um, most of their sales force, which are the agents, are, be are paid on the variable basis. So. Um, they are only paid once they um, clock in the revenue in terms of the transactions. Uh, so this um, structure allows both companies to very easily maintain or grow their high ROE given the um, uh, little to no debt requirement of the business. And on top of that, uh, we can see that both companies are able to beat or if not um, over match the movements of the property market. If you took, take a look at the tran, um, transaction volume and against their revenue, year-on-year -year change on the graph on the right. So uh, you can see that both companies were able to match or beat the movements each time. For example, in just uh, last year, there was an 8% dip in the transaction volume, the overall transaction volume. However, both Propnex and APEC Realty recorded a 6% and 30% increase in re revenue respectively. So let's take a look at how the industry consolidated over the years. So Propnex and ERA have always um, consistently been the top two players in terms of the market share of agents. So they've always held the lion's share of agents uh, within the market. However, it's only in 2017 that Propnex um, overtook ERA Realty in terms of the number one position. Um, in terms of the number of agents, uh, this was primarily due to their merger with um, DWG, Dennis Wee Realty Group, in 2017. So um, if you take a look at the top, um, the top blue line, that's the 20% jump in the number of agents in 2018 onwards. And for, um, let's take a look at how they generate their revenue. So this is pretty straightforward. Most of their revenue is generated from the brokerage business, about 80% of revenue. And um, this comes from across all segments. So you have the, um, the sales, which comes from the primary sales, um, secondary sales from the private residential as well as HDB resale. Um, they also do some commercial industrial, uh, though it's a smaller part of the segment, they are primarily in residential and um, not forgetting the leasing um, segment across private resi, HDB, and commercial and industrial. There's also a non-brokerage related um, revenue stream. So this comprises mostly royalties by their sub-franchisees, their overseas sub-franchisees, as well as some fees from the property value, their in-house property valuation and management services, as well as some um, auction services that they have. For the costs and expenses, the single biggest component is the cost of services. This is actually the commission paid to the agents. So this is um, largely in line, um, we always move largely in line with the revenue, given that this is a um, split, um, this is like a fixed split between the agents and the agency. Um, this split varies between 90-10, 80-20, and 70-30, depending on the experience of the agent. However, for new sales, the split is almost exclusively 90-10. And this is just an illustration of how a transaction would pan out. So on the left, we have the primary sales, and on the right, we have the resale. Um, the key difference between uh, both is that if you take a look on the diagram on the left, um, for primary sales, the agent will get a 0.5% um, fixed 
override um, of the gross, bro gross broker commission. So um, this amount will always be uh, zero, a fixed 0.5%, meaning that even if the developer gives the agency 2%, they would still get a fixed 0.5% out of that 2%. So if they pay 5%, they'll still get um, an absolute fixed 0.5%. Um, I'll explain a little bit more on that um, in the next slide. Um, for the agencies, the main thing to note is that there's the timing uh, issue in terms of the revenue recognition. So what you see in 1Q19, uh, their latest results is actually still reflective of the post-cooling measures period, which is the September to December, and potentially um, before that as well, because of the um, the timing um, of the recognition, especially for primary sales. The primary sales, um, there's a um, much longer waiting period in terms of um, getting the sales and purchase agreement um, at the SPNA as well as the options to um, be formalized and gone through the, the, the various stages. So generally, it's a longer revenue, revenue recognition lag for primary. So um, for pri primary, we can expect a lag of about um, up to six months. And then for resale, we can expect a lag for about three months. And from there, it will flow through to, um, the lag will flow through from the payment from the developer or the seller to the agency, and then the agency to the agents. And this is a sensitivity, sensitivity analysis that we did between the commission rates and the market share and revenue. So um, it's clear to see that the market share will really be the main booster for the, um, for the revenue side of things. And then also something to note, as I mentioned earlier, for primary sales transactions, um, um, in re regardless of the amount of the gross broker commission that the agency gets, the agency will only get the 0.5% fixed cut. So in some cases, they, they may, it may seem like their GP margin is uh, diluted. However, this is mainly because they are only getting that, zero point, that fixed 0.5% cut. So um, just something to note if um, that, that, that's not reflective of their um, profitability because they are only going to get that fixed cut um, no matter what. So the key risk for this industry is the um, the losing of market share to other agencies. As you can see during the consolidation period over the past few years, uh, the smaller agencies have been um, losing their agents to the bigger, um, getting eaten by the bigger boys. So um, this is a key risk as well. Um, and it's not necessary that even if the big agencies acquire um, merge with the smaller agencies, there would be a, a bigger expanded headcount. This is because there could be uh, attrition rate from the um, culture clash. And also there's a potential technological disruption of business. Uh, we've all read in the news, there's a tech platform such as Oh My Home, which um, have set themselves out to displace agents completely. However, we believe that there's still a long-term um, that's still a long-term thing, and um, there's still a need for an agent to personally show um, the buyer a physical asset, as well as know the ins and outs of the property business, especially the negotiation process. So that's more of a longer-term thing. And even if we, um, uh, even if that really happens, that would only probably affect the secondary business. So uh, primary business is still um, safe for the much longer term. And on the left, we just have a table of the pre and post cooling measures effects for primary sales and resale. So um, especially for primary sales, the developers have thrown in a sweetener in terms of higher commissions to the agencies. So this underscores the, the pivotal role of the agencies in pushing out the sales for the developers. And uh, in terms of outlook, um, aside from gaining market share and also um, uh, being the first to to show results once the volumes pick up. A key upside would be the um, acquisition of overseas markets. So um, some of uh, these two agencies really have sub-franchises in overseas markets. So eventually, if they own or consolidate these operations, um, that would help to diversify the earnings base out of Singapore as both agencies have close to 98 or 99% of the revenue from purely from Singapore resi.
and investment actions uh, we initiate on this sector with a buy on APEC Realty, 65 cents, and a buy on Propnix um, with a target price of 63 cents. Um, yeah, so go through um, on APEC Realty. Um, uh, we all know of ERA Realty, this is a household name, uh, not just in Singapore, but um, other markets that they are, they are in. And um, this was this counter held the number one market share in terms of agents for the longest period, only up till 2017. But just to note that they had not had any agency consolidation exercises to date. So they, are, they were able to organically grow its agents, agent, their agent base purely from their market, um, reputation as well as their brand name. And they have a very meaningful international presence. If you look on the chart on the right, they have over close to 18,000 agents, over 600 officers in uh, 10 countries in uh, APEC alone. And um, they hold the ERA regional master franchise rights for 17 countries. And recently, they also had a strategic uh, cooperation agreement with ERA Indonesia as well as Thailand. So um, this paves inroads for them to go uh, further in terms of their overseas expansion. And as I just mentioned earlier in the outlook for the entire industry, this would help to pave the way for them to uh, acquire these overseas agencies as well to eventually diversify their earnings base out of Singapore. And for them, their non-brokerage stream has been lending them a buffer. And especially if you if you note that uh, gross margins for non-brokerage segment is 88% compared to the GP margin for brokerage uh, segment at 10.7%. For uh, APEC Realty specifically, they acquired ERA APEC Center. So this is their investment property in, uh, they acquired in June 2018. So this helps to add on to the group's stream of non-brokerage income. And this is just um, the three main segments for APEC Realty. So mainly um, the real estate brokerage, that's where the revenue comes from, close to 98% of their revenue. On the left is their franchise, which I just talked about. And they have um, a wholly owned uh, subsidiary, RIA. This, um, this segment conducts trainings and courses for their agents. And they also conduct um, valuation work for their clients as well as the certain property management services. Um, these are the fees that they charge um, in terms of the commissions and also the commission, the split, the 90, 10, 80, 20, and 70, 30 split that I talked about earlier can also be found below. So um, this is more or less the same uh, for both agencies. Um, you can take a look later um, once I flash out the one for Propnex. So for new home sales, um, all agents will receive 90% of the commissions, uh, regardless of the cumulative gross brokerage income. So for primary sales, the split does not uh, apply. Everyone will, will just get 90-10, including uh, new agents which uh, who sell a new unit. So we initiate on APEC Realty with a buy and target price of 65 cents. And it's currently uh, trading at a PE of about 0. Point, uh, sorry, um, at a PE of 9.15 times. Then uh, moving on to Propnex. So Propnex is currently the largest real estate agency. Um, they only um, recently jumped from the number two position in 2017 after merging with Dennis We Realty. And they are still um, gaining market share. So previously the developers, um, especially in the primary sales segment, they were not the first um, agency in mind for the developers to call to in, um, invite them to market their launch. However, it's only been recent times that um, they have gained market share in this segment. So there's still um, a platform for them to grow in this segment. And um, even though the agents, agent count does not correlate with the market share of uh, transactions, uh, meaning that just because you have a bigger, bigger um, um, many more agents than the other competitors, that does not mean that you do get the transactions, but they did push through to show that they are still able to um, have this correlation in terms of getting the market share as well for new launches. And for Propnex, they are unique in the sense that they are very uh, agent focused. They invest a lot in the engagement of their agents. 
So the whole regular um, trainings, uh, boot camps and quarterly conventions, as you can see on the right. And this helps the agents to properly guide the home buyers during the process. And similar to APEC Realty, they derive bulk of their revenue from the brokerage services segment. And they also have similar non-brokerage fee income segments. And this is the commission structure across the different segments and the split of commissions, which is quite similar to that of ERA. So we initiate um, on PropNex with a buy and target price of 63 cents, and it's currently trading at a PE of 8.92 times. I'll move on to Elvin. Thanks, Tara. Okay, uh, we'll talk about the telecom sector. So we'll, cover, we'll be covering these few topics. We'll start off with mobile. So mobile has been de uh, declining because of the decline in legacy services such as voice and IDD. Uh, there's also more competition from MVNOs and there's also less excess data charge due to uh, higher data allowances given to uh, consumers. We also did a study of the dilution of revenues from uh, SIM money plans. We estimate SIM money plans to be around 10 to 15% of uh, total postpaid. So we estimate that SIM money plans dilute revenue as much as 50% as you can see in the chart where premium, con uh, premium handset offers the highest dilution. So recently, there's a lot of change of offerings in the mobile space. Uh, it started off by Startup revising their mobile offerings as part of a rebranding exercise. So they did away with hidden charges and there's more transparency given uh, and also more data allowances. Singtel followed by uh, offering a pure digital products this is targeting the price sensitive and the digitally savvy consumers. And then M1 most recently last week uh, streamlined their offerings by doing away with complicated plans by just offering two mobile plans, which is the SIM only and uh, postpaid plan, which is a handset plan. So this uh, M1 differs by giving more uh, customizab customizability and increase in data allowances. So M1, as you can see this chart, is the most competitive as compared to the rest of the telcos. However, uh, that being said, Singtel offers a uh, non-price differential uh, offerings such as uh, pay TV content bundled, bundled into their mobile uh, plans. So we do not have the latest output data from uh, N1 because they are privatized now. So we can see that uh, output has been declining postpaid and prepaid. We think that this trend will likely to continue and stabilize in the end uh, of 2020. So we believe that there will be some form of stabilization because SIM only plans act as a transitionary mobile plan to handset plans. So what does this mean is that uh, as consumers uh, finish their postpaid plan of two years, they will most likely want to wait for a desired handset so they would want to move on to the Simoni space where they have more flexibility without a lock-in contract. So we do not expect the uh, percentage of Simoni which dilutes revenue to uh, form a higher percentage in the postpaid space. We also think that there will be negligible impact from the entrance of TPG. We'll talk more about TPG later. Uh, this is the MVNOs. So uh, Circus Life and Zero have lowered their prices while waiting for TPG's entrance. So on TPG, it's expected to launch uh, to late 2019. It has uh, delayed for almost a year. So mobile trials started uh, end 2018 with 20,000 subscribers and then later expanded to 200,000 subscribers in March. So the trial offers free unlimited data for 12 months. The speed will be kept at one Mbps after the first two gig per day. So TPG has uh, surpassed the IMDA target of nationwide outdoor coverage. Uh, I'll show you a chart later on. So we think that the impact to TBG will be minimal, at least in the near term, as there's the wow factor that there's a new MNO in town uh, is dis dissipated. And also MNOs and MVNOs have already had a full year to uh, revise their offerings to ensure there's no uh, gap that TPG could enter or to tap on. Also in recent news, the ACCC opposed the merger of uh, TPG and Vodafone. So we think that 
TPG would focus more of the resources to the mobile network rollout in their core Australian market. So this was the quality of service uh, set by IMDA. So as of uh, date, TPG has already have more than 99% coverage for outdoor. So they have surpassed it by one year. So they are left with the tunnels and in-building uh, coverage, which is relatively weak at the moment. So moving on to pay TV, uh, industry pay TV revenue declined by 5.6% in 2018. So attrition to OTT players continue. We saw Starhub subscribers uh, shrunk by 55,000 year on year, while Singtel 14,000 year on year. So Starhub in the near term would face a higher attrition because of the ongoing uh, migration of cable to fiber. Uh, Singtel, we think that they are able to maintain subscribers because of uh, their bundling, their pay TV content with uh, mobile. So uh, there's an ongoing process of switching content costs from fixed to variable. Uh, Starhub highlighted that they are left with one major renegotiation and Singtel is progressively phasing out the unpopular content. So we think both Delco's cost structure could improve. We expect is the segment revenue to stream 10% and for subscribers to contract by 8%. Uh, we expect some form of stabilization in 2020. So moving on to broadband, uh, according to IMDA, the broadband penetration is now at 93.5%. We think that there's still room for, uh, to grow till we reach 100% penetration. Uh, there's also competition with smaller players such as ViewQuest and MyRepublic. But we think this competition will be mitigated by the growth in the new households and uh, corporate. So there's also a, a thing where the households have dual broadband for separate use cases such as gaming. So we expect industry revenue to be stable, grow 1.2% uh, in 2019 and 1.7% in 2020. So you can see the fluctuation here is because of uh, M1's aggressive broadband packages. So this industry revenue has uh, taken out M1 because they have been private. So enterprise segment, we still maintain our view that uh, enterprise will provide growth to the telcos or at least uh, mitigate some of the headwinds from mobile and pay TV, especially for Starhub. We expect a progressive rollout in 2019 and 2020. Management has also indicated that there is more uh, traction in the coming year. So there's also increased demand uh, as communicated, there's uh, increased demand in managed services across government financial services, hospitality, transport, SME, and healthcare. We also think that there will be potential for 5G, especially in industry automation, remote surgery, and smart city applications. Hence, we, put, uh, we factored in a growth of 20% in 2019. We also think that uh, cybersecurity will be a growth driver for enterprise. Uh, global spending on security, hardware, software, and services will top 103 billion in 2019. This is up 9.4% from 2018. So, Singtel and Starhub is well positioned to benefit from the increase in uh, spending in cyber security. Starhub has also recently made a joint venture with Tomasic to form and sign a pure play cyber security business. Moving on to 5G, uh, IMD has maintained its projection for 5G to be commercialized in 2020 and a wider scale deployment in 2023 and 2024. Uh, right now, the use case is pretty much enterprise uh, with uh, industry automation and mission critical re applications such as remote surgery, which requires lower latency. So IMDA has expressed that they wanted 5G to be a standalone network, which means there'll be minimum two nationwide. This translates to almost doubling the base stations needed. So the likely scenario would be that Starhub and Emma will co-bid for uh, one and one spectrum and Singtel will build its own. So 5G also requires uh, more base station as there's, uh, they use higher frequency bandwidth. So this is positive for Netlink Trust because that we, the telcos will require uh, Netlink's extensive fiber infrastructure to roll out the 5G. So 5G also allows network slicing that can place uh, that can take place concurrently in the same location for different use cases. Example, IoT sensors for low bandwidth, mobile data for high bandwidth, video streaming for ultra high bandwidth, and mission critical for ultra low latency. So this gives the operator the ability to customize and tailor services 
to meet the demands of consumers. So th this is also more cost efficient, uh, offers a shorter time to market and enables businesses to innovate faster. So moving on to Singtel's regional associates, uh, we, we think uh, competition remains intense, however, it's stabilizing. There has been no downward revision from uh, Reliance Geo for almost a year already. Uh, as a result, we anticipate a price hike from Geo as they seek to gain returns on their 40 billion US dollars investment. Uh, Airtel is now targeting higher revenue generating subscribers. And also we saw uh, uh, in 3Q19, Apple has improved 4% with the help of minimum recharge plans. So we expect some stabilization in 2019 and for it to improve in 2020. Uh, for Telecom Cell, we think the worst is over. Uh, there's significant improvement in the market, especially in the uh, prepaid segment. So this uh, improvement was after the SIM re-registration where competition was very intense. We also were able to observe a significant increase in mobile broadband traffic. So Globe uh, enjoyed a PBT growth of 38% in first Q19. We saw uh, huge positive momentum uh, owing to data monetization and internet services. So we think this trend will continue as uh, uh, in Globe, there is still a lot of use uh, in voice and IDD. So the, like, there's more upside for data monetization. So these are the outputs for the, for the regional associates. So you can see Airtel has been stabilizing. We, we do not have the latest uh, Apple because of the rights issue that's going on. So with that, we upgrade Singtel to buy with a higher target price of 3.66, previous was 3.31. Uh, we like Singtel for its recovering regional associates. We also think that the Singtel will benefit from this rollout of smart nation initi initiatives and the higher demand for managed services and cybersecurity. Uh, we expect improve in revenue of EBITDA for digital business and we forecast an EPS growth of 5% in 20, uh, FY20. There's also a committed dividend yield of 5.6%. Uh, Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, upgrade due to the improved regional associate valuations. They have declared uh, to commit 17.5 uh, cents in this year. For star, we agreed, uh, we upgrade to accumulate with unchanged target price. Our upgrade is due to the recent share price movements. So uh, Starhub is still faced with headwinds from mobile and PTV. We think the enterprise provides shelter and we expect enterprise revenue to grow 8% year-on-year -year with the help of managed services and uh, cybersecurity. We forecast the EPS growth, uh, EPS decline of 3% year-on-year in FY19. So we are still waiting for further uh, clarity on the profitability of Ensign and how it flows through. Uh, we think it may be a potential re-rating catalyst for Starhub. If we take analyze for, uh, first skill results for Ensign, it would have hit his uh, hit its uh, revenue target of hundred million. So moving on to Netlink, uh, we upgraded due to share price movement as well. Uh, so Netlink has one point three three million fiber and end users. This is to support the core uh, stable predictable predictable revenue stream. We think. Uh, the growth will come from new household estates such as Pongo, Tenga, and Singkang. Hence, we attribute a 10% growth in residential. So, uh, according to IPO projections, it, uh, the resident collection bet, beat the IPO projection and also beat our street consensus on the uh, growth of residential connections. So, we expect uh, not MBAP connections to gain traction and for non resi to be stable. We are also optimistic on the uh, 5G poten potential for uh, Netlink Trust. The EBITDA margins we are uh, expected to be stable at 70%. Management have co committed to this. And also, uh, this translates to a strong cash flow to support the 208 million distribution we forecast for FY20. So this is the historical and forward dividend yield. Next, I'll move on to Tian. Thanks. Um, I will move on the China state banking sectors. Uh, we are overweight on the China banking sectors basically because we are thinking the China the banking sector's uh, asset fundamentals are robust. Also, we are expecting some more institutional firms com uh, coming into the banking sectors. 
For the positive, um, positive side, we are seeing the Chinese banking sector's the capitals are increasing, basically be, um, benefit from the PBOC's credit easings and monetary easing. Also, the uh, starting from the 2019, uh, 19, uh, China's, uh, China's regulations that already um, encourage Chinese banks to issue the perpetual bond and uh, were classified as um, perpetual bond as a tier one asset. At the same time, we are uh, we are seeing the increasing uh, capitals are uh, boost the bank's willingness to to, uh, to increase the loan size. And as for the asset qualities, the on um, the, uh, on 2019, we are seeing the provisions coverage ratios for non perform uh, rooms and the uh, are increasing in the uh, in the background as the regulations they set for the. Uh, the ratios from the 120s to 115s. So there's a more room to, uh, for the provision coverage. For the negative side, we are, uh, we're expecting the PBOCs may uh, lower down the interest rate, will put the pressures to for the interest margins, but uh, we're thinking it, it will be offset by the increasing long size and its growth rate. For outlook, we are expecting the more long-term institutional fund will be um, flow into the um, banking sectors. Um, uh, for foreign capitals, we are seeing the MSCI is the Chinese Asia's the capital. Um, banking sectors accounted for 30 percent. For the uh, 46 the flagships index, the banking sectors accounted for uh, over 40 uh, 40 percent. Also, the um, Insurance the funds and the uh, social security funds will flow into the uh, China insurance market, and the banking sectors will benefit from this. Uh, this is the few ETFs that checks the China's the uh, uh, largest bank, um, uh, CHIX, FXI, um, and the two Hong Kong listed ETF. As for China last week, the, on last Friday, the China's the Commission says they will uh, release the list of the hit list of uh, unreliable um, group, com uh, un unreliable companies, the groups, and individuals. I think the, uh, this is the mean to um, be reacted to the uh, US, uh, US site, and uh, I think the, uh, the exact measures will be released uh, in the coming this months. As for the stock performance, the, um, for last week we are seeing the utilities are keep um, continues to perform well. Although to, uh, although we are seeing uh, for last week the communication sectors are performance uh, relatively well, but uh, we are thinking there is still a, a a lot of uncertainties and the risk, so we are not recommend to buy the commission stocks. Uh, in the in the stock uh, in the in the environment of uncertainties, we still recommend to buy uh, uh, defense and defensive stocks like utilities and the financial st stocks. For the financial sectors, we are um, uh, continuing since the regional banks are performed well, um, the insurance the companies are performed well. Um, that's all for today's the channel and um, with least I will move on to the way to for the technical analysis. Uh, thank you, Jian. Uh, right now, we're going to look at uh, China Merchant Bank uh, weekly technical outlook. Uh, for China Merchant Bank uh, weekly China analysis, we have two scenarios. So I'll go through the first scenario. Uh, basically, both scenarios has um, uptrend uh, momentum. So we are currently very strong bullish. We have a very strong bullish outlook despite a false breakout in March um, 2019. Um, the, the strong bullish candle closed above the 38.2% of Fibonacci level over here. Uh, actually, uh, gave us an added conv uh, conviction that uh, is currently is is it will be going into a um, into a strong uh, bullish um, sentiment. So uh, we have basically uh, used Fibonacci extension to identify uh, two target level. Uh, which is 127.2% and 161.8%, uh, namely $53.75 and $58.71. And uh, so uh, for scenario two, uh, market may have the uh, potential and opportunity that will correct itself to the support zone two uh, identified over here at 61.8% of the total Fibonacci uh, swing high and swing low. Uh, price level will be at $32.85. So, however, uh, should the target, should price actually retrace to that support zone to identify, um, our target price um, remains unchanged at 127.2 and 161.8. So, let's move on to our Singapore outlook, the Straits Time Index. 
um, based on the straight time index and the wave count, current wave count is at the corrective wave two of the minor wave. Um, the mini wave of the wave one, one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C has already been completed. Um, the sub, the bigger sub wave A, B, C is actually uh, ongoing, and we believe that based on the Fibonacci analysis, and should the thirty thousand, uh, should three thousand psychological level is being broken. Um, prices will still have the downside to go until uh, 2800 or or twenty seven thousand six hundred five dollars of uh, points. I mean, so um, uh, with that, um, uh, is there any question? Uh, Dior, is there's no any other question? We will end the meeting. Thank you.